insight and we're excited about this <clears throat> um that would just have to tolerate me I'm, I'm, I'm back home and uh so i, I realize that barbara did a fantastic job last week but i'm back cancel the mute cancel the music <laughs> i'm glad he's home i'm glad he's home jerry you know we love you Thank you. Thank you for loving me. <laughs> All right. Everybody ready? Everybody got your Bible open? We're recording, but I'm yes. not sure Andy's audio is working. Yeah, that's why he left. Okay, Andy's not present. And, um, he can plug back in. We got a lot to cover tonight. We're going to try to get through chapter eight and have uh, some opportunity for discussion. Oh. All right. Father, we magnify you. Lord, you're all together lovely. There's none like you. Father, we give you praise. Father, we just lean into you tonight. Yes. We lean into you. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for this privilege. We thank you, Lord, for those that have died and sacrificed so that we can have this privilege. Father, this is Veterans Day. Yesterday was Veterans Day. Father, we thank you for those men and women that gave supreme sacrifice, years of service, so that we could have this liberty and freedom. Father, we thank you, Lord. We release right now. Father, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Amen. In this United States, yes. Father, as it is in heaven, we decree, decree and declare thy will, thy purpose, Father, in this United States. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are on the throne and you make the decisions who the kings and rulers are. Yes. Father, we just decree and declare that, Father, we align ourselves. Yes. Witness of the Holy Spirit. Yes. We align ourselves as disciples of Jesus Christ. Mm. We align ourselves as sons and daughters of the Most High God. Yes. Holy Spirit, come in right now and open the word. Yes. Show us Jesus like we've never seen him before. Yes. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. I feel his presence. Yeah. I feel his presence. Yeah. Amen. Glory and honor, Lord. Jesus' name. Wonderful name of Jesus. Oh, Let's oh. Your name, Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Jesus. Precious Thank Jesus. You. Hallelujah. You go, Mama. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Woo, glory. To you be the glory, Lord. Mm, there's no one like you, Lord. No one like you. You're the most high God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You're with us always. Always with us. Never leave us nor forsake us, Lord. You're always there for us. No matter what we go through in life, you are always there with us. Yes. You're always on our side. You are in us and through us and all around us, Lord. Hallelujah. We praise you and glorify you, Lord. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. We love you, Lord. Yes, Lord. You, the mighty name of Jesus, forever the same, yesterday, Today and forever, Lord, you are with us. Hallelujah. And we Amen. glorify your name. Hallelujah. God is so good. All the time. We're going to look at. Time. Yes, all the time. We're going to look, uh, start off uh, for the sake of time with the last verse of chapter seven. 
says, for he taught, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribe. Mm -hmm. So um, many theologians uh, look at chapter eight and say that this is a chapter on the authority that Jesus uh, comes down off the mountain after the, the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, then he starts demonstrating his authority. Well, um, it's, there's no doubt that this is a, a chapter about authority. Um, but we're going to look at another component that Jesus demonstrates over and over in this chapter. And that is compassion. So, um, a according to Strong's, uh, the word authority means power, the right to act, the ability to act, the privilege to act, the capacity to act, and the power to delegate and to give power. So, Jesus, uh, you see, as he has all authority in all kind of situations. We're going to look at that, but uh, we want to look at how Jesus interacted with the people in chapter eight. Um, Lila, would you like to read? Okay. Lila, would you like to read? It means you yeah. next. Okay. Uh, um, read Matthew 8, 1 through 4. Okay, sure. While he was come down from the mountain, great multitude followed him. And behold, there came a leaper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put, his, uh, Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will. Be thou clean, and immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said unto him, See thou tell no man, and go thy way, and show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So we see it's, it's plain and clear the, the demonstration of the authority of Jesus healing a man of uncurable disease. Body in agreement that this was uh, a demonstration of authority. Okay, but let's look at the compassion that Jesus demonstrated. So, uh, according to the tradition, if you got within a, a uh, a reasonable distance of a leper, then you were con considered unclean. If you touched one, then you were, it, it was a uh, terrible consequences. But here, Jesus reached out and demonstrated his compassion by touching this man and an untouchable. He had been outcast by society, his family, and was, was forced to quarantine for the rest of his life. But yet, Jesus reached out and touched him. Do we see the compassion, how he went beyond? He gave more of himself. And that's what he's asking us to do. I found it interesting that there was a great multitude that was following Jesus at the time, coming down off the mountain, yet Jesus told the man to be silent. Right. Told the man to be silent, and the man came worshiping. He didn't come asking. He came worshiping. He came humbly, with a humble attitude, and said nothing about himself. He didn't say anything like, Oh, I need it. Heal me because I need to go back to work or heal me because I need to support my family. It was nothing about him. It was all about the willingness of Jesus. He said, 
if you are willing, he didn't even say if you're able. He, I believe he probably knew he was able, but the leper came all pointing to Jesus and all pointing to the heart of Jesus and to his willingness. And Jesus, I read in one commentary that Jesus wasn't even defiled by touching him. Right. He, because Jesus had the capability of once he touched him, he cleansed him. Thus, he was no longer a leopard. And if Jesus could cleanse the leopard, leper. Jesus, leper, mm. leper, sorry, then Jesus was well able to cleanse, cleanse himself because he too was a priest. He was a rabbi. And so he had the authority both by law and by position to cleanse himself. But yet he told the leper, the man, to go and show himself to the to the priest. So uh, it's interesting that this is the first time a leper had been healed. I bet the, the, the scribes and the Pharisee, Pharisees had to look a long way to find out the, the procedure for cleansing a leper. They had, they had to do some digging on this one. But they... they uh, in Leviticus, it describes the, the procedure, but uh, another reason that Jesus told uh, the leper to go and offer the gift that Moses commanded was at the end of seven days after the cleansing period, the priest had to give him a document. They had to put in writing that this man had been cleansed of leprosy, and they had no explanation how it came about. They only knew that this man was a leper, and now he had no spots and no blemishes on his body for seven days and had to give him a certificate that says so. Hallelujah. That's like going to the doctor, and the doctor say you got cancer, and, and then they come back after uh, getting in the water for uh, a period of time, and they have to give you a clear document of good health. It just <clears throat> like uh, to the praise of God, to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his power. We see that Jesus sent the man back so that he would have a document to return to society. Amen. He could return to and, and uh, once again be joined to his family and back into society. I also want to add that um, as I started into chapter 8, after reading chapters uh, 5, 6, and 7 of the Sermon on the Mount, we had declared in the beginning and decided that the Sermon on the Mount was basically the um, handbook, the citizen's handbook of heaven. This is how we are to behave. This is how Christians would act in the world. This is how, this is our handbook, those three chapters being called the Sermon on the Mount. And so I kind of challenged myself. I said, okay, let's go back to this handbook, the citizenship handbook and see how does this fall, how does this fit into, how is Jesus taking his do this, live this way in those three chapters and been demonstrated in his own personal life as he is walking through his ministry. And I decided that Jesus was also merciful. He Absolutely. was, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And compassion and being merciful, they kind of go hand in hand. So Jesus demonstrated not only to the crowd, but also to the man he healed, that he was being merciful to him. Absolutely. Right? That's good. That's good. Anybody uh, so we're going to go on to the next uh, paragraph, uh, verse 5 through 13. Marcus, would you like to read Matthew 8, 5 through 13? She means you, Maurice. Maurice, I'm sorry. It's all Maurice. Right. I'll do all your translations for you. I got you. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Okay, I'll be Can you hear me okay? No. Come I'm just a, a tad, yeah. tad bit closer. Better, not really. Better. A little bit closer. <laughs> I tell you what. Let me. There you go. 
Hold that up to your mouth if that's your microphone. Yeah, that, hold that up. Okay, okay. That's a lot that's better. Good. Okay, from five to till eight. Five to eight, five to thirteen. Okay, five to thirteen. Okay. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, and saying, "Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of of the palsy, grievously tormented." And Jesus said unto him, I will call, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou should come un under my roof, but speak the word only, and my oh, servant yeah. shall, shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so, it, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in that self-same hour. Hallelujah. And, Amen. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thanks, friends. Yes, sir. So uh, Jesus is entering Capernaum, the headquarters of his ministry, and a Roman centurion, a an officer who had a minimum of a hundred men under him, came and approached Jesus through the crowd. He came forward, it says, and uh, presented his need to Jesus. Uh, we see. It's pretty clear the authority that Jesus demonstrates, but let's look at the compassion. A Roman centurion was not accepted in, in a Jew's home. Here, Jesus being a Jewish rabbi, entertained and accepted this man's request. Uh, a centurion was the most uh, involved in the community. He was the face of the, the enforcement um, in the community, but he also had to be in charge of the morale and the behavior and the success of, of over a hundred men. And uh, the centurions were, um, were kind of like mayors and they were, uh, approachable by the people and the people would come and and uh, present their needs to the centurions but they weren't Jews they weren't they had no access to the synagogue they were the uh, invaders in the Palestinian homeland they were not welcome but do we see the compassion that Jesus operated in? Yep. Amen. It seems like um, verses 11 through 11 and 12, when he starts talking about Israel and coming from the east and the west and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it, that kind of, when you read it, can seem out of place. But yet, he was talking to the centurion about his faith Amen. and saying, no greater faith has there been seen in all of Israel. So, and then going on to say that, and I say to you that, is, that there will be many coming from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So... I looked that up and I said, why is Jesus referring to the forefathers speaking to a Roman centurion? 
And come to find out, Jesus was basically saying, Israel has come to me with attempts to be righteous through their works. The law. Through the law. But yet you have come to me in faith. Without the law. And it's so good. it's, he's saying that even though in all of Israel, I've not seen any faith, but he's saying, but one day all these people are going to come to Abraham, <laughs> sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. But yet they'll be cast out because they don't have the faith in Jesus Christ as Messiah. They only had their works to attempt to prove his righteousness, which we all know, Doesn't if work. you know anything about the word, your works won't get you anywhere when it comes to heaven and your relationship with Jesus. You have to have faith in Jesus Christ. So then Jesus said to the centurion, verse 13, go your way and so, and as you have believed, there it is, faith, so it will be done for you. And his servant was healed that very hour. Now, Jesus not only had, not, he demonstrated compassion for the centurion officer, but he also demonstrated great compassion for a slave. A slave was, uh, was a, a monetary, it was, a slave was considered a, a, a living tool. A slave was considered uh, like a like a hoe or an implement, uh, barely barely better than a donkey or a mule. But but Jesus had compassion, and he didn't heal the centurion; he healed the slave boy, servant. Jesus, you can write this down in your notes. Jesus never forgets the servant. Jesus never forgets the servant. Pastor Nate. Yes. Mute your mic, please. Wow. Is my mic that sensitive? Wow. Yes. This Thank you. Nice. I knew it was a good mic. That's good feedback. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, all right. Here we go. Uh, now, I read... Barbara and I went round and round on these next two verses. And uh, I, I, I see a whole lot in these two verses, but uh, Barbara's begging me to cut it short. So uh, if somebody would, wants to volunteer to read uh, Matthew 8, 14 and 15, that would be good. Okay, I will. Go ahead. Jesus went into Peter's home. Is my mic on? Yes. Go. Yes. Yeah, read, okay, Don. So, Yes, so then uh, Jesus went into Peter's home and found Peter's mother-in-law bedridden, severely ill with a fever. The moment Jesus touched her hand, she was healed. Immediately she got up and began to make dinner for them. Awesome. I like that translation. Um, so up until this time, <clears throat> the two previous miracles were done in the audience of a crowd. Here, Jesus demonstrates a private miracle. He demonstrates uh, his love for the family. He demonstrates that it's not about publicity. Jesus demonstrates once again that he is uh, in authority over every, every disease, every abnormality, and uh, verse 14, Don, it says that uh, she was sick in bed. What does your translation say? It says, then, uh, then Jesus, Jesus went into Peter's home and found Peter's mother-in-law bedridden, severely bedridden. ill with a fever. Bedridden. Now, uh, there are three different um, types of fever in, that were common in that era. In that, that location, and but uh, malaria was probably what this lady had, and uh, even when you're cured from malaria, 
and you get the right medicine in you. You don't just jump up out of bed and go to work. Here she had been in bed for probably a month or two. Jesus touched her and instantly, immediately, Mark would say, she got up, healed from malaria, and fixed them supper. Amen. Hallelujah. That is, and, and, okay, we talked about the compassion that Jesus demonstrated uh, for the servant boy. But here he heals a woman. And in that day, women had no rights. Women were, you know, they, they were, they were human, but they had no rights. And here Jesus goes in home and, and Peter didn't ask for Jesus to come touch. Jesus just went and demonstrated his compassion and touched Peter's mother-in-law. Probably because Peter's wife couldn't cook very well, and uh, Peter's mother-in-law could. That's probably why he did that. <laughs> oh, come on, brother! I'm a... Y'all not laughing? Hey, I even unmuted just to laugh to support you. <laughs> so, going on to verse sixteen, and when evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon possessed. And he cast out the spirits with, with a, a word. word. Come on. And he healed all who were sick. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. So once again, his unlimited compassion. He, he, he didn't, you know, just say the first 100 or whatever. It was all that were brought to him. And all were healed. All that were brought to Jesus were healed. Yes. I think there's a precedent there. When we, when we come to Jesus or when we bring our loved ones to Jesus, you can stand on this scripture right here. All that were brought to him were healed. And no one was left out. It, it didn't matter what the disease was, what the abnormality was, the paralytic, the demon possessed, though, those sick, any infirmity was healed. Right. Unlimited authority. Yeah. Unlimited compassion. Yes. He just kept on and on and on until they were all touched. Yes. So we begin, Matthew, by indicating that part of Matthew's goal in writing the gospel was to reflect on all the things and prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. So this is one, here again, we see that he fulfilled, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. So if we can, let's turn to Isaiah 53, verse 4. Isaiah is in the Old Testament. It's just past um, Song of Solomon. It's past, it's past Psalms. Close to the middle. Very close to the middle. In chapter 53. 53 what? In verse 4. 53 verse 4. And it says, surely he has borne our griefs, which means sicknesses, not just our grief like over a death, and carried our sorrows, which is our pains. Those things that cause us pain or sorrow. Yet we esteemed him stricken smitten or struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Here again, even in the prophecy by Isaiah, it includes us all. Oh. Us all. And so for the prophecy to be fulfilled, not only did he heal their sicknesses, but he had to heal all in everyone's sicknesses, Very not good. just 
um, Peter's mother-in-law. Yeah, or, or certain ones. It's all sicknesses and all who come to him, all those who were sick. Awesome. Um, Amen. Right now, as I can, can I go go to the next one? Mm -hmm. Okay. As I was reading this, I got through that and I went, man, I don't know. This was like a, it was like an aha moment, but yet in the same token, I'm going, I've heard this all my life. Why is it just like now? Why is this an aha moment now? But I was reading this and I said, it just dawned on me that sins are forgiven and sicknesses are healed before the cross. Before one stripe was laid on his back, before one nail was driven in his hand. I'm going, why didn't I ever think about this before? Because we always think about those benefits of the covenant benefits being on this side of the cross. But yet it's happening on the other side of the cross, even all through the Old Testament. The Old Testament is there to support the New Testament. The New Testament supports the Old Testament. You cannot, no it's also. not good to have one without the other. No, you, no you, you need both of them to have a full word of God. But it was like, man, Jesus was healing before the cross. He was, he was forgiving sins before the cross. And I, I don't know what that, if that does anything to you, it, but it just like, it shows how us. much more, there you go. how much more now on this side of the cross, should we be looking and expecting healing, looking and expecting forgiveness after the work of the cross is done? After we have full access to the father, we see his nature, but now we have full access. That's good. Thank you for making that clear. Amen. That's awesome, Barbara. All right. So um, verses 18. And when Jesus saw a great multitude about him, he gave a command to depart to the other side. A certain scribe came and said to him, teacher, I will follow you. Wherever you go, and Jesus said, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Then another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first bury my father. But Jesus said to him, follow me, let the dead bury their own dead. So, The first verse, uh, verse 18, says that Jesus said, okay, guys, uh, we, need, we need some R&R &R time. We need to, to have, take a break here. Um, Y'all get, get a boat ready. We're going to the other side. And on the way to the boat, two people interrupt him, stop him. And we see the compassion of Jesus. He gave them time. He gave them time. He did not rush. He did not uh, um, push them away. Even though he was tired, he had ministered the whole night before and got up early and trying to, to get to the other side of the river, uh, other side of the lake, rather. And these two earnest men, probably, uh, came and and approached him wanting to follow him to be his disciples and so what was his response one that says teacher i will go with you wherever you go that sounds like he's very eager wanting to get there wanting to do his part his, wanting to be a disciple of jesus and he was a scribe knowing the, the knowing law. the laws yes he was a scribe so he wasn't an ignorant person he was willing to leave is his teaching and learning of the scripture and follow Jesus, even though he had probably heard the full description of the Sermon on the Mount. Yes. 
But what does Jesus do? He has to him start to count the cost. Let's count the cost of discipleship. Let's count the cost. What is this going to cost you to follow me, to leave your family, to leave your position at the synagogue? It will cost you possibly that you'll have no place to lay, to lay your head. Okay. And then the other one says, I'll follow you, Lord, but I need to go first and take care of my dad. Bury my dad. Some commentaries say that they don't even acknowledge. He doesn't acknowledge that his father is dead. Or sick. Or even sick. But the in the Jewish tradition, children would take care of their parents. So oh. it could have been a very long time before this young man would come and follow. So Jesus says, let the dead bury their dead. Now how's that going to happen? The spirit, let the spiritually dead bury the physically dead. Come on and preach. If you're spiritually alive, the cost of discipleship is easy to bear, easier to bear. If you're spiritually alive, you will give whatever Jesus requires because of your relationship with him. You're spiritually alive. So you want to follow Jesus. If you're spiritually dead, the cost of discipleship is huge. That's why people fall away sometimes. And so Jesus was saying, let the spiritually dead bury the physically dead. You come and follow me. So Jesus describes and defines the, the principle and, and the guidelines of apprenticeship. To Jesus. Here he demanded uh, strict, uncompromising commitment without distraction. So um, foxes have holes, birds have birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man, we talked about that earlier, that, that the Son of Man was Jesus' uh, personal favorite description of himself he did not call himself the son of god he always called himself and pointed to himself as the son of man and and later on we'll see that the demons addressed him as the son of god but they would never address him as the son of man but clear uh, but the son of man in verse 20 has nowhere to lay his head and that He's talking about authority. All these, uh, we, we have looked all through the scripture in, in Matthew chapter 8. It's about Jesus' authority. Here, he's saying he is looking for a place to lay his authority. He is looking for a place, for some, some place, some person that can handle the power of his authority in the that world that he was living in right there. Now, you can't put your hand, if there's a fox in a hole, you can't put your hand in that hole. Because he has authority you'll and power. Up, you'll come up with a no? Yeah, you'll come up with a no. You can't, even, even a snake cannot uh, rob a, a mockingbird's nest without expecting uh, the bird to defend itself, defend its eggs. But Jesus said... I have no place. I have nowhere to lay my headship. S-H-I-P. I have no place to lay my authority. That's what Jesus, okay, let's go back to uh, chapter 6, verse, verse 9. It says, in this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we see Jesus is praying. He tells us to pray that the authority of the Father's kingdom be established on earth. Here Jesus said, I've looked to and fro, and I haven't found a place yet that can handle where I can release my authority 
on the earth today. Acts chapter 2 is coming where he can release his authority and release his power upon the bride of Christ to operate thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. Amen. 23. Amen. Barbara, would you like to read um, 23 through 27? You're muted, Barbara. You're muted. There we go. Now, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. 23 through 27? Yes. Okay. Now, when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you faithful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Amen. Oh. Amen. Do I, did, I miss one, did I miss 28? You did No, well. ma'am. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> so we see that Jesus had unlimited authority and power over the atmosphere, the elements, and uh, once again, People marveled, even his disciples marveled. They had seen the, the, uh, the miracles that Jesus was doing. The contrast, I think, just it, that would have blown me away. From hurricane to becalmed. So these guys were, were used to uh, sailing. They rode their boats, but they also uh, had sails, and they went from a hurricane strength wind and waves to verse 26, and it says, and there was a great calm. Commentary said that there was no wind, and they had to row the boat. It was calm. We see Jesus' authority, but can we see his compassion? Can we see how Jesus was like a father with a frightened child? He recognized that the children, the, his disciples, were frightened and fearful. But he didn't rebuke them. He rebuked the wind. He rebuked the surroundings. He rebuked the sea. What a loving father we have. What a, Jesus said, you, uh, I only do what you, I see my father do. I only say what I hear my father say. So Jesus here is demonstrating the love of the father, the compassion of the father. We see the nature of his father demonstrating through the son of God how he was so tender with the, the disciples that were in the boat. So this is an example of the part of the Sermon on the Mount that says, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and the door will be open to you. So here was an opportunity that as the disciples heard that sermon from the citizen's handbook of heaven, they said, I remember we're supposed to ask and it shall be given to us. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the disciples came asking for mercy asking for jesus to save them it doesn't say that they didn't have any faith that's right it said that they had oh you of little faith i i think that their their faith was not so much as as we have today faith in god but they had faith in jesus they knew where to go they, they knew where to go for help. And, and I, I don't think that he rebuked them saying, why are you fearful? Um, 
Jerry co commented this morning. I, sorry, I don't remember if you said it already, but just like a, a father with a little child. If a father and a little child and the child is afraid of a thunderstorm or afraid of... Is paralyzed by fear. Is paralyzed by fear. Whatever may be causing the fear, the father doesn't rebuke the child for being afraid. He takes that child, holds him, hugs him close, and attempts to dispense the fear by letting them see that there's nothing to be afraid of. That that thing will not hurt you because, one, the father has you, and two, it's not as bad as what our imagination makes it out to be. All right. So uh, this last portion of... The, the two demon possessed men is a another demonstration of the power and compassion. Wendy, since you're not driving anymore, would you like to read um, 28 through the end of the chapter? Unmute, unmute your phone for your. There you, there go. you go. Thank you. Okay. So it's 28? Yes. To the end of the chapter. Okay. And when he was come to the other side, unto the country of... Okay, uh, I learned how to say that this morning. Uh, Jer... 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 Genesis. Jer... Genesis. Jer... Genesis. 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 There you there go. Met him, there met him two possessed <clears throat> with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding fear, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, your Son of God? Are you come here to torment to us before the time? And there was a good way off from them a herd of swine feeding. So the devils besought him saying, you cast us out, allow us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said to them, go. And when they come out, they went unto the herd of swine and behold, the whole herd of swine violently down the steep place into the sea and perished into the waters. And then they, that kept them fled and went into their ways into the city and told everything what was befallen to the possessed of the devils. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coasts. Very good. Thank you. So the uh, side note on in my Bible uh, for this, it says, when pigs fly. <laughs> Written in by Jerry. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> when pigs fly. Okay. Um, we obviously see the authority that Jesus was operating in, that uh, these two demon-possessed men could not be bound. They were breaking chains. They were cutting themselves. And they were so fierce that they uh, had the road blocked off and no one could even pass by that way. What I found interesting uh, is in the authority of Jesus. Number one, the demons recognized and called Jesus by name. They knew that they were in the presence of the Son of God. They called him by name. They recognized and identified him to everyone that was there. The other thing uh, I noticed was they, they recognized their end. They recognized that they were going to end up in torment. Mm -hmm. As, Have you come here to torment us before our time? Mm -hmm. They knew their destiny. Mm -hmm. Demons know their destiny. They have their their destiny is sealed, and they have a limited time that they can operate until that destiny 
is comes about. The third thing we see is they ask, they ask, don't just release us into dry and desolate places. Can you please just let us go into the pigs? They ask and they requested their outcome. The next thing is uh, we see that the authority that Jesus operated in to not only deliver one demon-possessed person, but two, and that the, uh, the demonstration was so powerful that all the people came out to see. They had to see this with their own eyes because of the renown of these two men had the whole countryside sequestered and was affecting their trans their their uh the way that they traveled they had to bypass and go a different way one other thing to say but go ahead but the, the shameful thing is is that the people of the town that of the countryside were more interested and more concerned about their livelihood being gone than they were about their spiritual misery and their spiritual condition. So because their livelihood was gone, their pigs were gone. Their pigs were all dead. They were in the sea. They had no more livelihood was why they asked Jesus to leave. We don't want you. Depart from this region. They begged him. And so Jesus couldn't do any further work there, even though they saw it. They had been living with these men in the tombs. They, they, they could have encountered these men on a daily basis, some of them that were tending to the sheep. And they, they are to the pigs. They dealt with him on a daily basis. And they could tolerate them. They got accustomed to their behavior. Ooh, come on and preach. That is good. They got accustomed to their behavior. And, and they could manage. And they could manage the two demon-possessed men while they were taking care of the pigs. Hallelujah. But they could not see their own need for Jesus after their livelihood was gone. They were more concerned about their livelihood and their loss thereof. Than, their spirit. than they were about their spiritual situation and wanting to say, you know, what a difference it could have been if they would have said, Jesus healed these men. Stay with us. We've got others that need healing. We've got others in the town. My, right. my brother's got this. My sister's got this. Come and heal the rest of us. But no, they begged him. And when they saw him, they begged him to depart from their region. Hey, what a shame. Yes, what a shame that um, the people did not have the insightfulness into their own need for Jesus, their own need for something greater than what they had. Willing to manage, willing to be inconvenienced, willing to have to go a different way down that, than that road to uh, tolerate these two demon possessed men. Okay, uh, so in verses, verse 18, Jesus said, uh, who saw the great multitude, he said, uh, we're going to the other side. Y'all prepare a boat. So Jesus was inconvenienced by the scribe. Jesus was inconvenienced by the disciple as he was planning and moving to go get in the boat. As, as they got in the boat, Jesus they, the disciples uh, were affected by this hurricane, a great tempest. Jesus makes it, and the disciples make it to the other side to, dem to minister to two men. He spent all day to minister to two men. He got back in the boat and, and went and crossed back over to his own city, verse uh, one, of verse nine, uh, chapter nine. He went back to Capernaum. Do we see the compassion that Jesus was willing 
the inconvenience to go a, a night's journey across the sea, the Sea of Galilee, because there was a need of two men that were demon-possessed. We saw in, in verse, all that Jesus was willing to minister late into the night for all those that were brought to him. And he healed them all. He healed them all. Amen. Jesus kept nothing in reserve. He laid it all out on the line. Jesus demonstrated his compassion. So as disciples of Christ, our closing note for us to ponder this week in our own lives is as disciples of Jesus Christ, the cost of discipleship is let's have compassion on those we come in contact with. And are we willing to go be inconvenienced to have compassion on others? Yes, we are. Amen. Amen. We receive it. Amen. Thanks, guys. It was good preaching. Go ahead, Nate. Close it out. Pastor yeah. Nate. Thank you, guys. Everybody give my hand. That's all they get out of this is just a, a good old hand clap and telling them we love them. Probably a few kingdom points, too. <laughs> and keeping record. So, mighty God, we just thank you for uh, Barbara and Jerry and every precious soul here. Lord, we just surrender this group to you. We impose nothing upon it. Okay. You're absolute king, ruler. We need your glory. We need everything about you, Jesus. So we just surrender this Bible study. Take it to 200, 300, or 20, or keep it small or large. Whatever you want to do with it, Lord, we surrender it to you. We ask that you just seal up inside us, not only our hearts, but in our flesh, in our minds, our will, our emotions. Seal this message up here in Matthew 8. We love you. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Real quick, for those watching this on, on video, if you've made it this far, if you're not sure that you have salvation, if you're not sure and something's moved you to find out more about what it is we're talking about here, then go to deliverancerevolution.org. There's a link that says contact us. It's super duper short. It basically just gives me the ability to email you and invite you into the group. We've got a deliverance group and healing group and prayer group every day but Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern time. So deliverance revolution dot org contact us also if you need immediate deliverance and prayer there are some prayers on the website the link says prayer or prayers very powerful prayers very powerful they encompass all kinds of things from marriage prayers to generational curses uh, sexual sin type prayers witchcraft prayers on and on so it's a veritable resource there for you but we want you to join us join this group join the daily group uh, and we will, once you contact us, we'll contact you back and we'll make sure you know who Jesus is. We thank you for joining us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's all about Jesus and the good things he's done. Flaming wide these gates, let's see his kingdom come.